morning, everyone. It's very exciting to be here. And most um, one thing that I've said throughout yesterday, it's amazing to see so many kombucha breweries around Europe, and not only in Europe. I've seen people coming from the States, from Canada, all over the world. It's amazing to have this kind of event where we can network and meet like-minded people who are all in the struggle. <laughs> because sometimes it is a struggle. So yeah, my name is Christy Hall. I'm the co-founder and CEO of the Good Guys Kombucha from Finland, and more recently, head of KPI Europe. Thank you, Hannah Kram and all the KPI members for your support. It's amazing. Um, so, what is the Good Guys all about? We started our brewery early last year, 2018, and our mission is in one sentence, what would the good guys do? So when you're looking at scientific literature around kombucha and gut supporting bacteria, oftentimes they're referred as the, the good guys, and the bad guys being the ones that make you sick. So we figured that, well, that's a very apt name for us, the good guys. And also it helps us in making decisions when we are thinking of what should we do, what kind of products should we start making or brewing and uh, developing. We often ask ourselves, we always ask ourselves, what would the good guys do? Is this something that we can proudly be behind and say that this is the product we want to be out there? And also when we are working within the community of uh, kombucha brewers and our customers, everybody in our uh, community, we think of what would the good guys do? It's not about us first, it's about us as a community first. And as when the community is doing good, then we do good as well. Uh, products, currently we have four bottled flavors. I hope you've had a chance to taste our amazing yeah. flavors. And then we just launched our third, fifth flavor, which is an herbal kombucha. It's not brewed with tea, it's brewed with, uh, with a different uh, leaf. And then we also have tap systems and cakes, so we um, provide uh, <coughs> kombucha to our cafe and restaurant customers. And this is an avenue that we are looking forward to uh, developing in the we don't have that many bars or restaurants with, uh, with kombucha on tap, but we definitely see there's a demand and it's definitely growing in Finland. And then uh, through our web shop, we sell kombucha starter kits, we sell tune uh, scobies, kombucha scobies, teas, tea plants, and everything one needs to brew kombucha at home, really. And also tea, because as uh, Rupert mentioned, uh, our background is in tea. We got very, very interested in tea and then led to into kombucha and we wanted to finish people to drink more tea. And now they are, without even knowing it, they're drinking kombucha and they're loving it. And they're like, oh yeah, actually you're drinking tea. Um, why we sell kombucha starter kits? We feel it's the best way of marketing and educating uh, customers and the wider audience what is kombucha, what is authentic kombucha. Because the most authentic kombucha you can make is always the one you make at home. There's no doubt about it. That that's the most authentic kombucha you can ever make. And now, when we have a different um, variety of different kind of kombucha out in the marketplace, for people, regular people, it's sometimes very hard to uh, distinguish the differences or say what what, what makes this different uh, different this kombucha that costs two euros compared to ours that is for for fifty. Now, when you make, once you make kombucha at home and you develop the palate and you know how the process works, you know how the kombucha tastes at home, next time you go to the supermarket and buy kombucha, you'll definitely not buy the cheapest one because you know it doesn't taste good. It, it doesn't taste the same as you make it at home. And oftentimes our customers come to us, come to us asking, well, you know, sure, I can make kombucha at home, but surely I can't make kombucha as, as good kombucha as you guys have made. And we are saying that no, actually you can make a lot better kombucha at home. You just have to invest some time and effort into brewing kombucha. So for us, for us it's working very well. And name and resources. We founded the company with seven founding partners. Uh, four of them work full time and then three part time. We have one guy in video uh, mastermind. He's behind all our photos, our videos and, and all this um, digital marketing. And then. Uh, we also have, a, uh, sorry, I forgot something there in my team. Uh, we have a husky, one kombucha dog, that is a very, very faithful guy, always waiting outside the brewery. We're taking him out for walks, a very integral part of our uh, company. Then style, uh, all started and all kombucha, everything is produced in-house. 
We don't. We buy tea. We buy sugar. We get uh, water, of course. But everything else is brewed in in house. So no uh, concentrate, or kombucha concentrate, no high density kombucha or acidifiers are used. Personally, I think if we would use something like a an acidifier, a high density kombucha, to stretch our uh, kombucha to get to reach uh, a bigger volume, that's similar to what they do in the soft drink industry, where they buy a compound in a black, uh, factory plant, and then you mix it with water, then you mix it with CO2, you bottle it, and you sell it. That's perfectly fine, but that's a soft drink in my books. So, oh. and uh, yeah, and it's very, very important for us because at the end of the day, what you're learning here when you're brewing kombucha is that you're learning, you're creating expertise on working with bacteria and yeast. And no, it's not easy. It is. It's a wide ride. Everybody knows how it feels when you have bottles exploding and you're pulling your hair out of your uh, head and trying to figure out what's going on with my room. But that's the expertise that you're creating. That's something that no one can take away from you. Because then you know how natural world, how bacteria and yeast work. And you can leverage that not only in kombucha, but kimchi, everything fermented, everything that's living. So I, what, why I want to emphasize this so much is that there are a lot of new breweries out here today. And I don't want you to get the impression that uh, it, is a, it is an industry standard to use high density kombucha, acidifiers, and so forth. No, you can brew all your kombucha in house. Of course, it's going to be harder because it's a natural product. It's just like whiskey. If you have 18 years old whiskey and someone comes along and says, I have two day whiskey, uh, are you interested? Maybe some people are, but it's not 18 years old whiskey. You can't reduce time in a process that requires time. That's the whole craftsmanship in kombucha. If you want to have the craftsmanship, then you have to do the hard work and learn the stuff. And that's a great way of conveying the message to the wider public as well, because when people come to you in a booth when you're having at an event and ask, like, how do you produce your kombucha? You have the expertise and you can convince the customer why your kombucha is very good and living an authentic and so on. Then flavoring, uh, we do uh, fresh juices. So in, in, in the case of our fresh ginger, fresh ginger for instance, we buy organic ginger, we have a cold pressing machine, we put it in, we put, uh, press it in the juice, and then we add it to the kombucha. So that's how we do. I know uh, every kombucha brewery has their own methods. We have visited many kombucha breweries and I've seen very many, many different methods of flavoring, but that's what we use when we really like this uh, cold press method. It gives a very nice, um, fresh flavor. Okay, great. This is our first brewery. We rented out the sauna <laughs> next to us. <laughs> before that, before that, we were brewing in our uh, bedroom. Uh, we were producing kombucha there in three liter glass jars. And then we moved into the sauna. That was actually the next block. It was very small space. And no, we didn't, weren't using the sauna for any other purposes. It was dedicated for our kombucha brewing there. That is our first vessel. But the main reason to go there was to get out of home. You know, like we were brewing a uh, long time in home, and then we decided, okay, we want this to succeed. If we want this to become something bigger, we have to take the uh, leap of faith and go and try to brew bigger batches. We had no idea if this 200 liter vessel uh, would ever uh, produce good kombucha as we brewed in smaller batches. And the main issues we had. Obviously, developing the brewing process. We had no idea. We had probably ten different uh, like methods of brewing kombucha, but we didn't know which of these ten methods would uh, yield the best the tasting kombucha and be the more, most consistent. So we had to do that. Then also we uh, worked on recipes. You see Hannah here uh, sipping one of our kombucha. Seems to be a very good kombucha this time. And then <laughs> inconsistent proofs, of course, when you're changing a brewing method every time, you have inconsistent proofs. Some of them uh, uh, not very proud of, like tastes horrible. Then some of them that's just going moldy, and some of them uh, coming out very, very nicely. And then obviously the lack of knowledge in commercial brewing. So we had to do the work of uh, getting the licenses in place. We had to contact the food authority to ask what is needed <coughs> if we are setting up a commercial kombucha brewery. Well, they didn't know, but then we'd have to um, have the a conversation with them on the, the, the basic ideas what we need to have in place 
and then HACCP plants and uh, we are certified organic, we had to learn how to become certified organic uh, producer. So there's a lot of things that we had to learn within a small period of time. And we were here for three months and then we decided, okay, now we have to get some sales. Otherwise, if you don't get any sales, uh, we're not going to be in the business for very long. And uh, I was terrified, personally I was terrified, like, oh no, we're not ready, we're not ready, we can't sell this product yet. But my, uh, our business partner, Marcus, he was saying that, no, we just have to do it, you know, like, we are entrepreneurs, we have to get the product out there, and once we get feedback from people, then we know if, if we are actually doing, uh, proving good kombucha or not. Otherwise, I would have been in the sauna for the rest of my life, probably. <laughs> So three months after, we got our first uh, commercial brewery up and running, uh, and we did our first sales. You see Hannah over there singing and dancing, He's, she's following. Nowadays we don't sing and dance anymore, because 60,000 hand followers uh, there, uh, the song is kind of very well. It's not fun anymore. Uh, and then uh, you see the uh, sales still thanks to have over there. They look very funny if they catch on the stuff, so it's all that that how you guys do it. Um, and main issues, but we, this space was uh, 100 square meters. In the beginning, it was okay. We built our uh, walking cooler there, and we really learned on um, by doing a lot of mistakes. The walking cooler was too small. The door was too small. Um, we had temperature control in our fermentation room. The room at the other wall is just you know the green thing. I don't know how you call it in English, but we just set it up as a wall. And it was, um, we heated it because we, we're living in Finland, we know it's going to get cold in the winter. But we didn't expect to have a very hot summer. We had three months of plus 30 degrees <coughs> and there was no way to cool the, the, the fermentation room down. And all the aircon machines had sold out before we realized that, okay, well this heat streak is going to go on for a while. So we turned our kombucha into a very, very yeasty, bad tasting, bad smell kind of a beverage, which we had to toss out, thousands of liters. It was very stressful. And at the same time, we were bottling some of the slightly too active kombucha, which resulted in the kombucha bombs. So we were selling these to supermarkets, we were selling these to our customers, and then customers calling us and saying, yes, so a couple of your bottles exploded in our fridge. Is this something we should be concerned with? Yes, it's definitely something you should be concerned with. We'll come tomorrow and we'll pick everything up, okay? Just please don't sell them to anyone. And then the customers calling us saying that, eh, thank you for the turmeric in my kitchen uh, ceiling. I will never get out of it. I will never get it out of there. Like, would you want to come and clean it out yourself? So like, no, thank you, but thanks for contacting us and we'll send you some more bottles. And they're like, no, you don't have to really. <laughs> <laughs> Very stressful, like psychologically, the, one of the hardest summers I've ever had. We were doing everything by ourselves, like uh, deliveries. We are based in Tampere, which is almost 200 kilometers from Helsinki, and we are selling most of our kombucha to Helsinki, the capital city. And uh, we, have, we put everything in the van, we start driving to Helsinki, we deliver, we bottle, we produce, we do everything uh, in house, and then at the end of the summer, we have to go back to Helsinki to get the bottles that are exploding, take them back to the brewery, open them by hand, and empty the bottles. It's like this insane, this is just insane. And so we, we figured that we have to do something, we have to learn fast, otherwise, again, we're going to be out of business and out of our minds quite soon. Um, so we were planning the scale up financing, equipment, material, sourcing. There's a lot of things you need to do, need to consider when you're scaling up. And at this point, we had no idea whether our uh, plans are um, uh, battle-proof, like uh, if they're sound. But we didn't know about the process, like how does it affect when you go from we were brewing 1,000 to 2,000 liters per month. So if you are increasing that to 10,000 liters, how will it affect the taste? How will it affect the, the process? We had no idea. We just visited a lot of kombucha breweries. We were being open and uh, we, were, we were being open and saying that hey, this is what we are doing. This is what we are looking at. Could you perhaps help? But then at the same time, we understand every kombucha brewery has their own process, their own method. And why? Because there's no book about a com uh, commercial kombucha brewery. If you're setting up a beer brewery, plenty of uh, resources online. You visit one uh, uh, beer brewery and you have it figured out, okay, well, these are the equipment I need, this is the process I need to follow, and so forth. But in kombucha, if you ask someone, okay, tell me a process, you will not understand why they're doing it 
because you haven't seen the whole journey of how did they, how did they arrive at that, those decisions. And then finally, uh, six months ago, we got a new brewery that is almost 400 square meters. So those the three doors over there. And then this is how it looks like in our, in our uh, one of the uh, rooms that we have there. So now the main issue, and we are producing somewhere around 12,000 liters per month now, and everything's done in house. We still cold press all the tincture, we still cold press every the turmeric and carrot, and uh, I know that at some stage it will be a question whether we still want to do all this choosing ourselves, but so, uh, so far we are doing everything in house. Um, so, main issues now learning how to operate commercial brewing equipment. <coughs> Before, when we were bottling, uh, manually bottling, the question was like, do we have enough people uh, during the day, like on Wednesday we're bottling, do we have enough people coming in? And now the question is that, do we have enough spare parts for the, <laughs> the bottling line? If something breaks down, a valve breaks down or something, do we, how do we continue production? Now the problem is different. And I'm not the technical person, I don't know how to uh, fix a bottling line, I have no idea. But then you just make the calls. You call to those people when the, when the line isn't working and you have people on the other, both ends of the bottling line uh, sitting idle and doing nothing and then you have to produce then you call some people and say, okay, help me out, I have this machine. Have you ever, do you have any experience in this machine? No? Okay. I call the next guy, I call the next guy, I call the next guy and until someone says, take this valve out and change this and maybe you have a spare part, fix this. Okay, cool. Okay, three hours gone, but still we got the problem. <coughs> so the problems are different, but the problems are always there. And then of course distribution, sales and marketing. We were in a very, very fortunate position like uh, before this scale up, that everything we produced was sold immediately. We didn't do any sales because our customers really liked our kombucha and they were calling us and saying that we want kombucha. And even those customers who were not reordering, we couldn't contact because we were afraid that they would order again and we don't have <laughs> <laughs> the and like, Okay, we're just sitting in the brewery, brewing everything we can and uh, sending everything out. Now we're in the space where we can actually open the sales and go talk to people, hey, this is our kombucha, and now it's available, you know, and now the problems are slightly different. <laughs> and then, of course, managing customer accounts, getting bigger accounts. Bigger accounts are more demanding than smaller accounts. If you have a cafe, they order maybe a case, two cases, three cases of kombucha every, every month. But it's very different from uh, a supermarket chain that is ordering by pallet loads. They need different kind of uh, service. And then, key learnings, yes. Don't hesitate to ask others and be willing to learn. Oftentimes, ignorance is not the, the point, uh, like the reason that people don't learn. Oftentimes, it, it is because you think you already know what you're doing, what is uh, making you not to learn. And go for kbi has a tremendous network of uh, like-minded people. Uh, other kombucha breweries, be open, industry consulting, uh, we went for Hannah Crum, amazing consulting uh, tips we got from Hannah for scaling up and, and, and in terms of how to get consistent brewing, she knows a lot about how microbes like bacteria and yeast, how they work, and then Facebook groups, kombucha microbrewery being one, kombucha professionals being another, a lot of people have the, uh, the knowledge but you have to dig deep and contact the right people to get the information you need. Then glass bottles and glass tarts, very, very hard to find in Europe. I don't know why, but it's insane how, far, how hard it is. <laughs> One of the hardest parts in this, in, in this business has been finding glass bottles. We went through di three different uh, uh, bottle styles, and we were scratching our heads, like, what, what's wrong with these suppliers? They can rely on these, uh, uh, sell us these bottles. Until early this year, we went for our custom bottle. So we got a custom mold paint, so now that we have a unique bottle in Europe, um, obviously we had to buy a, a lot of the bottles, uh, 49,640 bottles now sitting in 340 feet containers outside our brewery. But then cash flow wise, it's, uh, it's very hard because you have to buy everything beforehand. You have to put the capital in. But then again, it's better to have those bottles than not to have the bottles because if you don't have the bottles, you don't have any sales. So we've got to do that. And if if you are thinking of having your own bottle made, if you're struggling with the same uh, problem, just please come to me after this presentation. I'm more than happy to share the information. We'll be sourcing our bottles. 
they have a great agent, and of course the, uh, the minimum order quantity is quite large, but maybe you can pull like a couple of uh, breweries and have a bottle made yourself. And then check for government funding. We got 35% uh, of all our capital investments uh, <coughs> covered by the European Union, and so check your own Ministry of uh, Agriculture for this kind of uh, grants if you're looking into uh, investing in your uh, kombucha facility. Uh, kombucha actually is listed under Annex 1 product in European Agricultural Fund, which means that it's, it's an agricultural product. Normally you get only 20% for all the capital investments, but in kombucha's case, in Annex 1 products, you get 35%. That's a lot of money. And then lastly, don't stop believing. I'm a fan of the, the band Journey. They have an amazing song, Don't Stop Believing. You need that every now and then. <laughs> when you feel that there's no way out, just listen to that song, it's very good. Do I still have time for the video? Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 So, my background is in bank risk management, I did financial consulting also beforehand, so uh, I was very intimidated by food authority, it has a big name, food authority, so we, uh, we did everything, like we write, wrote the document on uh, what we are doing and what are our processes and so forth, and then when they came over, I slammed everything in their face saying that this is everything we know, this is everything, absolutely everything we know, and they're like, okay, I've never heard of this product but you seem like an expert in this area. That's fine. <laughs> I'll go to the next cow farm and I'll inspect the cow farm as I normally do. So they, had no, they didn't have that much experience in kombucha, but they took our word that we are experts in this. And we just had to have in place, like how do we control alcohol level, how do we uh, control pH, and when they know that okay, your pH is below 4.4, that's in the, the limit in Finland, then that's fine. And then they want to know that we have in place systems like if we have to recall uh, our products, what is the standard? Like, who do we call? They want to know that we know what we are doing, and they also understand that mistakes is something that people always make. But how are we prepared in the case of the mistake coming? Like, how do we recall that stuff? Uh, in the last um, brew you have, maybe technical, but uh, I think a lot of people are wondering 
where is your fermentation effects? Yes, the fermentation room is in separate, like we have those three rooms that you noticed, uh, the three doors, they all similar like 120 square meter, uh, mm, how do you call them, like rooms, and one of them is fermenting and for raw material, like all tea and everything. So we have a fermentation room, we don't normally go and take people into the fermentation room because of cross-contamination risk. So it's only like a handful of our people can go <coughs> who work there, and we try to keep that as um, clean as possible. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Michael. I work for Rooming Cologne, Germany. And um, for months now, we have a lot of experience with tea. Um, and for months now, we've been brewing um, small batches, working with a small tea shop. Um, and we feel like we are just only scratching the surface in the tea world. It's something completely new to us. Actually, we um, have the tea from China, Japan, um, Taiwan, and everything, and India. And so, my question to you is what type of tea do you use, and how did you come to this conclusion? Great question. I love tea, and we have been experimenting with tea quite a lot. And we currently use a mix of green tea and black tea. The green tea being a Chinese sencha, which is very nice. It doesn't get as bitter as the Japanese sencha, even with the longer steeping time. Then also what we use is black tea, came black tea from China, which has um, natural sweetness to it. It has fruity notes. So when you steep that for a long time and you have it, it doesn't turn bitter, but it has this natural sweetness. Which, uh, which we have noticed that if you only use black tea and prepare kombucha, <coughs> the, the flavor is more like meat. And then we only use green tea, it's more like crap, uh, apple cider. So we have a combination of both. And we approach this, uh, the tea question from health benefit side. Oftentimes, if you have come to us saying, asking what are the health benefits of kombucha, one thing that you, uh, that you, you can always claim is tea. L using high quality loose leaf tea has a lot of uh, healthy compounds. Humans have been using tea for more than 4,000 years, and it all started from medicinal use. We had cauldrons, very big pots, water, put tea leaves in, <coughs> boiled it for a couple of hours to extract all the nutrients from tea, and it was bitter. And the people didn't like it, of course, because it's bitter, but they were having it because it was medicinal. It helped them in, in many kind of uh, illnesses. And nowadays what we see with tea is it's more like a culinary experience. Okay, I have my green tea, I steep it for a minute and a half with 70 degree water. Ah, it tastes amazing. That's right, it tastes amazing, but if you want all the health benefits, you want the high temperature and a long steeping time. And fermentation is beautiful in a way that even if you have a very bitter uh, tea in the beginning, you ferment it and the bitterness goes away and it unfolds an array of different kind of flavors. With different teas, you can do amazing things.